End of January 1943. The German situation in Stalingrad is totally untenable and continues to worsen by the minute. Due to the strong Soviet push, by January 22 the Germans lost the last airfield they still held in the vicinity of Stalingrad, which allowed them to receive a few supplies. After this, the weakened German soldiers who have already lost all hope of being rescued, retreat to the ruins of the city of Stalingrad, unable to do anything but wait there for their end. On January 26, the German forces inside the city were divided in two, making their agony even greater. The sick and depressed Paulus has been isolated in the southern stock of the city, and despite the critical situation, his orders continue to be to resist until the last cartridge, reserving the last one for themselves. By January 30th, when everything was more lost than ever, Paulus was promoted to field marshal. This promotion was partly in recognition of the great sacrifice that he had had to carry out, and above all, as motivation for him to fulfill that sacrifice to the last consequences, since no field marshal had ever accepted to be taken prisoner. On the other hand, Goebbels had everything ready to get the maximum possible benefit from this event, which he was going to sell as a great act of German heroism against the Red Army. Thus, this sacrifice would serve as an example for the entire country during the future combats that were to come. However, his plans, as we are going to see below, were completely cut short. A day later, on January 31st, the Soviet vanguards reached the same barracks where Paulus was. In that situation, Paulus was on the verge of total collapse, and the surrender terms were carried out by his subordinates. This was partly to distance Paulus from this highly symbolic event that his capture represented. But what happened next? Have you ever wondered how Paulus was interrogated after he was captured in Stalingrad? Would you like to know how the conversation unfolded, and what did they want from him? Next in this program, we are going to analyze all the details of this event, as well as the peculiar reaction that Hitler had when he found out about this news. Finally, we will analyze what finally had to be said to German public opinion when Stalingrad fell. Once Paulus was captured, he along with other of his subordinates were taken about 80 kilometers from Stalingrad to the Soviet Don Front headquarters. There they were comfortably housed compared to the German soldiers who had also been captured. That night Marshal Voronov, who represented the Soviet High Command, and Colonel General Rokossovsky as commander of the Don Front, met with him to interview him. After some cordial greetings, Marshal Voronov was the first to speak, and he did so slowly and in short sentences, so that the translator could translate what he was saying. Colonel General, it's quite late and you must be tired. Voronov began by saying. We are too, because we have been working a lot during the last days. Therefore, tonight we are only going to talk about the most urgent problem. Suddenly, Paulus interrupted him, and said, Excuse me, but I'm not a colonel general, the day before yesterday I was promoted to marshal. Immediately afterwards, Paulus showed him a documentation where he accredited it. He finally said that under the circumstances, he had not been able to update his uniform. Both Voronov and Rokosivsky looked at each other strangely, because in such a situation, they did not understand how important that was. Immediately afterwards, Voronov continued speaking, this time correcting himself. Mr. Marshal, we have to ask you to sign an order addressed to the part of his army that still resists in the northern pocket, ordering them to surrender to us, to avoid useless bloodshed. Faced with such a proposal, Paulus responded in a state of total indignation, that this would be completely unworthy of a soldier. Is it possible to say that saving the lives of his men is unworthy conduct for a soldier when his commander has already surrendered? I answer Voronov. I have not given up, I was simply taken by surprise. Paulus replied. Faced with such a response, the two Soviet officers were surprised again, since they knew perfectly well what the circumstances of Paulus's surrender had been like and how he avoided suicide. Then Voronov continued saying the following. We are talking about a humanitarian act. It would only take us a couple of days or even a few hours to destroy the rest of their troops that continue to fight. This resistance is totally useless and meaningless, and the only thing that it will cause is the needless death of thousands of soldiers. 
The duty you have as commander of said army is to save their lives, and even more so when you have saved yours at the time of his surrender. From this point on, and according to the witnesses of that meeting, Paulus was quite nervous and was fiddling uncontrollably with the pack of cigarettes and the ashtray that he had on the table. After responding with other evasions and playing with all kinds of euphemisms, I finally end by saying, even if I signed that order, those German soldiers would not obey it, because if I had surrendered, as you say, I would automatically have ceased to be their commander. Voronov then told her that they would obey, since just a few hours ago, he had been their commander. Paulus for his part answered him again, and said, Since my troops were divided into two groups, I was only the commander of my pocket in which I was. The other one belonged to another commander, who in turn receives direct orders from the Führer's headquarters and those are the only ones that are valid. From here the conversation continued, each time with a higher tone and more evasive. Paulus commented that even if he decided to sign such an order, he could always be accused of being a forgery. The Soviet officials said they would send some captured German general to corroborate it, and Paulus in turn said again that it would all be useless for one reason or another. After this long and maddening discussion, Paulus finally refused to sign and the Soviet officials realized the futility of trying. I must inform you, Mr. Marshall, that by refusing to spare the lives of his subordinates, he is assuming a grave responsibility towards the German people and the future of Germany. Voronov said by way of farewell. At that moment, Paulus was totally silent, he just stared at the wall, finding himself completely depressed by all the torments that were stalking him. Lastly, Voronov wondered if the accommodation he was in was satisfactory, and if he needed some kind of special diet or medication for his illness. All I want to ask, Paulus replied, is that the prisoners of war you have just captured be fed and given medical attention. Voronov told him that with the difficult situation they still had at the front, it was very difficult to receive such a large mass of prisoners and to take proper care of all their needs, but that he would do what he could nonetheless. Paulus then thanked him and they parted. At this point, we have to indicate that more than half of those 91,000 German prisoners finally died during the first two months of captivity, only 5,000 finally returning to Germany. Once we have seen how Paulus' surrender developed, and the first serious meeting he had with senior Soviet officers by way of an interview, let's see word for word what was said in Hitler's headquarters when they found out what happened. They have formally and absolutely surrendered, Hitler said angrily and in complete disbelief. Otherwise they would have closed ranks into a hedgehog and shot each other with the last cartridge. Hitler continued comparing how a woman was capable of committing suicide at the slightest breach of her honor, and those men who called themselves soldiers, had preferred to go into captivity rather than save theirs. After the lament of one of the generals who were with him, Hitler continued saying that this was doing a lot of damage to Germany, because the heroism of so many soldiers who had died resisting, was now nullified by a weakling without character. One of the things that hurts me the most personally is that I still promoted him to quarterback, intending to give him that last bit of satisfaction. He could have freed himself from all harm and ascended to eternity and national immortality, but he has preferred to go to Moscow. Hitler finally said. For his part, Goebbels had been preparing the press and radio stations for days to unite the country in a martial duel, before the heroic final resistance of the Sixth Army in Stalingrad. The aim was that what had happened there, would continue to be remembered for centuries by German generations to come. However, and despite the fact that what happened was not what was expected, this was not going to affect in any way the intention of the speech that had already been prepared. The statement was issued as a special announcement on February 3, 1943, 24 hours after the last German holdout at Stalingrad had succumbed. From the Führer's headquarters, the Wehrmacht Supreme Command announces that the Battle of Stalingrad is over. Loyal to his oath of allegiance, the Sixth Army under the exemplary command of Marshal Paulus, has been annihilated by the overwhelming numerical superiority of the enemy. The sacrifice of the Sixth Army has not been in vain. As a bulwark of our historic European mission, he has withstood the attack of numerous Soviet armies. They have died so that Germany can live. As we have seen in the communique, no reference was made to the prisoners or the capture of Paulus, implying that they had all died. 
However, the real news had already been spread around the world, and any German who was able to tune into a foreign radio found out what had really happened. This, added to the letters from the soldiers, and what those who had been evacuated recounted, soon caused an alternative version to the one given by the German government to spread throughout Germany. And so far this program in which we have recounted in the most real and close way possible, how were all these events that are almost never explained about the end of Stalingrad? Do you think Paulus's decision to surrender was correct, and not later sign this order for the rest of the city's troops to surrender? Do you think it would have had some kind of validity? Why do you think he didn't really do it? If you want more information, I leave you in the description the program we have on Stalingrad with Jose Antony Penis and Carlos Caballero Jurado. Thank you all so much for being part of this community, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you as always every Thursday and Sunday, see you soon.